The following message is from Grace Point, an evangelical free church in Tucson, Arizona. We pray that you'll be encouraged and challenged by the Word of God so that you trust fully in Jesus Christ. More information is available at our website, www.gracepointtucson.org. The first over the last six weeks, eight weeks here at Grace Point, and we appreciate everybody's patience and input. We've been able to incorporate a lot of different cool things that have been mentioned and uh, just a great turnout this morning. Well, we want to get to some announcements first of all and uh, kind of bring everybody up to speed. It's only been like eight weeks, so, uh, but we have been giving announcements. How many of you were able to see uh, online our, our services one way or the other or either on YouTube or on our website? Yeah, it's been pretty good. Uh, I got to tell you, I'm excited because for the first time, we get to preach where people are here. It's very interesting when you're doing a sermon and there's nobody in the, in the auditorium except Tom Lodge, who was doing the sound. So, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Well, it's a real praise, isn't it, uh, that we're gathered together finally again. And uh, we certainly would anticipate as time goes on, others will feel more comfortable and starting to come. Um, so... You've spaced out pretty well, as, almost as well as we can, so thank you for doing that uh, very much. Um, youth group, we're starting to get some ministries back in line and going. Youth group's going to start meeting this Wednesday at uh, 6.30 to 8 o'clock, so make sure you, uh, our youth group's aware of that. Men's breakfast normally meets on the first Saturday of the month from 7.30 to 9. This month, we're going to do it the last Sunday, or last Saturday, uh, on June 27th, uh, and then we'll go back uh, in August, back to the first Sunday. We do it on July, but that's 4th of July weekend, and so uh, we will be sending out some information concerning that. Here's a big one. We are planning a question and answer time concerning our building project on Sunday, June 7th, next Sunday, following the morning service, and for those who will not be attending in person, we'll have a simultaneous Zoom meeting so that you can participate and be a part of that. Uh, we're going to send out login information uh, probably Wednesday and uh, a whole lot of stuff that goes with it so you can be aware and ready to go, asking that you consider your questions that you have as you read the literature and the attachments that we give. Uh, you can call the office. You can email us with those questions, and we can um, take care of those ahead of time or we can do them during the meeting. We're going to try to keep it to an hour uh, because of the funness of running a Zoom. Uh, is very interesting, especially when we do a large group. So please consider those things. Uh, we are postponing our Thursday evening virtual prayer meeting now that we're back on uh, meeting here. So uh, for the time being, that's a, a, a postponed meeting that we won't have for a while. Uh, You've done such a great job in keeping touch with everybody, uh, Grace Point family, elders, pastors, uh, prayer requests, things like that. So keep doing that if you would. Uh, as I said, this coming Wednesday or thereabouts, you'll be getting uh, the one call thing for the building project, a uh, one call letter, email, and et cetera. Uh, if you haven't picked up the 2020 Grace Point Church directory, they're available on the, on the literature table by the kitchen, make sure you pick up one of those if you would. And uh, then lastly this morning, we, because we're doing a simultaneous meeting, we want to be able to say hello to all those out in Zoom land today who are watching us. So what do we need to do, Stephen? What do we need to do? A lot of people on Zoom. Hi, oh, everybody. Everybody wave. <laughs> Hi. We're glad Hi, guys. We're Hello. We're Hi there. Wow, look at them all. Hi, Mara. Hello. Hey. Say hello. Hello. Oh, welcome. Welcome. We're glad Wonderful you're with to us. see you. Yeah, we're glad you're a part of us this morning. And uh, um, I'm assuming that Stephen's going to mute everybody during the sermon. <laughs> We don't need commentary while we're preaching, that's for sure. So uh, welcome. We're so glad you're with us. All right. We're going to uh, look at some prayer requests this morning and pray. And then we're going to have our praise team come up and we're going to fellowship for the, in singing for the first time together in over eight weeks. So 
Uh, we want you to be praying for Priscilla Valencia. She still has not heard how her test for COVID-19 has, uh, uh, what the results are yet. She's feeling better and better and better every day. So that's a real praise. Uh, but they should hear today or tomorrow uh, concerning that test. And, and the others we've been praying for, for Vonnie and Mary uh, Burton and Tracy Jorgensen's dad, Zach Freeland's dad, Marsha Moon, I believe, had her second round of chemo uh, this past week. And uh, we've been praying for our Here We Go building project. Uh, so let's pray together. Father, we love you today. We're so thankful that we've been able to come back together now. And it just seems like it's been such a long time. We pray for those who cannot be here today, who have made that wise choice in their life to postpone uh, joining us for reasons for the, uh, from health to uh, just uh, desire to wait and see how things are going. And we, we thank you for that. We pray that you would bless them today as they tune in on Zoom or as they get the message later on uh, this evening. Uh, we pray that you would watch over them and encourage their hearts. Thank you for these that we've mentioned this morning, very special to us. Uh, those who are uh, still experiencing these health needs, we know that you're the great physician. Touch them and encourage them and heal them. We thank you that you're able to do those things today. We thank you for our gathering. We pray that you would bless as Bob shares the message in a little bit. We pray that uh, you would be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Good morning, Grace Point, here and at abroad. It is good to see all of you and to be seen by many of you. Uh, I'm so excited to worship together with you guys today as God hears our voices as one. So go ahead and stand to your feet, and we are going to worship the Lord.
You are so good. Give it up for the Lord this morning. How great is our God. What a mighty God is worthy to gather and to give him praise. He's always worthy, Lord. you are so great. Father, you're greater than everything that's happening, Lord. You're greater than COVID, Lord. You're greater than the protests. You're greater than the sadness and the suffering. God, you are amazing and you are everlasting. And we worship you this morning, God. Thank you be for being so faithful in a storm. Thank you for remaining on the throne, God. Be that light. Help us to be that light to the world, Lord. i 
Yes, God loves it when you clap for him. <laughs> Amen. You guys may all be seated. A couple of things. Um, first of all, such a good turnout this morning. Not that saying we're going to go to two services, but we may have to. So i um, just wondering, how many of you, if we go to two services, would be at the first service, probably 830 um, maybe a third or so, okay. And then the others would be probably 10 o'clock still, something along that line. So, okay, we, I'm not saying we're going to do it, uh, but uh, it's exciting to see that we may have to do it. Uh, and then, um, secondly, we're trying to keep our service about an hour long uh, for the time being. So, uh, after I read the scripture, uh, we will not be uh, having a greet time. Uh, for that, uh, we've had a lot of little fellowship in between uh, or before the service, and we want to encourage you to, to do that, but we want you to do it kind of out in the warm sunshine, okay? And just encouragement, try to keep that distance if you can. We'd appreciate that very much. So now that you've settled into your seats, uh, let's stand back up for the reading of the Word of God, and then Pastor Bob's going to come, and he is going to share the Word of God with us. Our scripture reading is found in Psalm 119, verses 1 through 11. Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they also who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do, no, they do nothing wrong, they walk in his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. May God add his blessings to his word. I'm going to ask you to be seated if you would. And Pastor Bob's going to come and share the word of God with us today. Wow, it's nice to see some faces. The last several times I've preached, it's been to an empty auditorium. Reminded me back of when I was first in the ministry, I would go into the church on Saturday and uh, practice my sermon to an empty auditorium. And that's what's been like the last several weeks. It's good to see some faces here. If you were born 30 years or so ago, you might not understand this story. A pastor was visiting a family in his church. The, man, the, the mom, in the course of their conversation, being very proud of her family Bible, she looked for an excuse to show this nice, beautiful family Bible to the pastor. She thought of a verse she might ask him about, and so she told her young son, bring me the book we love so well. He left and returned in seconds with the Sears catalog. <laughs> it used to be that most people carried their Bible to church, and once uh, I would have asked, uh, what is that in your hands? And people would have held up their Bibles. Um, nowadays, most people don't haul a Bible to church, but they have it all in, on their cell phone. And uh, on it, they may have not only one translation, but several translations. Uh, though I have scads of Bibles, uh, I seldom open one anymore. Almost all of my Bible reading, Bible study, and ser sermon preparation is on computer. A few years ago, when I was on the board of the National Associ Association of Evangelicals, we would have national conferences, and with our national conferences, of course, there would be an exhibit hall in which people, vendors, would come and display their wares to get uh, pastors and leading laymen from all over the country to buy what they had to sell. Uh, I decided before I went to that convention that I wanted to buy a, a really good Bible study program and so the first day of the uh, conference, 
I went around to the booths and there were five of them selling major Bible study programs. And so I picked up their literature. And I studied it during the, the several days of the conference. And um, then the last day of the conference I had decided on what I would buy and so I went to that booth to uh, buy it. And uh, the man apologized to me, they were all sold out. I looked kind of dejected and so he said, but I can give you the conference price, which was nice because it was about $250 off. And uh, so uh, anyway, I gave him my card. He said, if you give me your card, I can give you the conference price. And then he added, oh, you're Robert Allen. You won the drawing. <laughs> he reached under the counter and handed me this $850 program free. That program includes hundreds of translations, several versions of the original Hebrew and Greek text with detailed analysis of every word. And there are also detailed maps and Bible commentaries and dictionaries. Uh, our world is changing, isn't it? But the advent of the computer didn't change the world nearly as much as did the invention of the printing press. It started with the Gutenberg Bible printed in the 1450s. Today, there are less than 50 copies of that Bible that have survived the centuries. It began with the pro proliferation of printed books but still, the most printed book in all the world is the Bible. Do you read? Do you have a favorite book or a favorite author? Favorite books are often revered. I think my mother revered Zane, Zane Gray's books. But almost every religion has its holy books. Judaism, of course, holds to the Old Testament. Islam has its Koran. Confucianism, Taoism, Shinto... Zoroastrianism, Hinduism, Krishna, Buddhism, Sikhism, uh, they all have their holy books. Christianity has the Bible, usually what we're familiar with, the Bible of the 66 books. The Roman Catholic Church has also with it the Apocrypha. Christian Science has Ellen G. White's Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. Jehovah's Witnesses have the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. The Mormons, LDS, has a Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, The Doctrine and Covenants, and the King James translation, as they say, as correctly understood. Uh, the LDS version of the King James Bible is, uh, is published. Now, over the past century, there's been a proliferation of translations of the Bible, each trying to do something unique or trying to be more accurate than others. That's a study in itself and not enough time to do that this morning. But the Bible that you have in your hands, either a paper one or an electronic one, is an amazing book. I have no idea how many Bibles I have. I used to buy a copy of every new translation when it came out and read it through in my attempts to read the Bible through each year. In our time together today, I'm going to look in detail at some specific verses, but let me start with uh, just a few of the hundreds of verses in the Bible, verses where the Bible says something, it records something about itself. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Psalm 119, 89. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Jeremiah 15, 16. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's desire, for I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. But prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Matthew 4, 4. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. 1 Peter 2.2 2, Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Isaiah 55.11 
So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I set it. 1 Peter 1.23 For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Matthew 5.18 I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now those are some grandiose statements. As the Bible talks about itself, does the Bible live up to these big statements? The Bible's been called a miracle book, and it really is. It's the most basic writing of major religions have only a single writer. Uh, and that writing uh, either originated a sect or a cultic faith, or the writing gave the religion stability uh, and a basis for their belief. But the Bible was penned by over 45 different writers over a period spanning over 1,600 years. Yet, it's a unit with the consistent message of truth that never contradicts itself. A title for the Bible I really like, I've used as the title of my sermon today, The Book That Knows Me. Our Bible text today is Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. It makes some big claims for the Bible. I'd like us to look at that description of the Bible, a statement about what the Bible does and why the Bible is powerful. Now first, how the Bible is described. Hebrews 4, 12. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You know, the Bible is a combination of a lot of things. There are truths, such as the very familiar John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. It has... The Bible has laws, commandments, such as, thou shalt not commit adultery. It has prayers and praises. That's what the Psalms are, basically. But there are also many prayers recorded in the Bible. It has promises, very precious promises, such as, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It has stories, and most of the Bible is stories. And there's a lot of teaching in those stories. Stories of Joseph, of Samson, of Ruth of Mary Magdalene, of Paul. And it has lists and genealogies. And each one of those with meaning and uh, very special points in them. Even the genealogies and lists. But notice the description in that verse. It is living. For the Word of God is living. There's an interesting parallel in the Bible. The same imagery is used. In the creation account, when God made Adam and Eve, uh, Genesis 2-7, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Do you know about the Bible? Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 uh, calls the Bible inspired. Literally, it is God breathed. So mankind is given life by God, sustaining physical air. It, uh, and the Bible, likewise, is given life by God, sustaining spiritual air. And a side light, you know, in Greek, uh, the word for air is pneuma, for which we have uh, in a lot of English words such as uh, pneumonia and uh, pneumatic. But that word is also spirit. And the context has to say, has to tell you whether it's talking about air or whether, or breath, or whether it's talking about my spirit or the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's the same word, pneuma. So the Bible is alive because God's Spirit is giving it life. Let me quote just one passage here because of uh, one thing it says. We'll look at it more fully in a little bit. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 15 through 17. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Bible is alive because of its author, 
God himself. God breathes into human words spiritual power and life. Now the second uh, descriptive word in this, in this verse is that it is active or powerful or energized. For the word of God is active. The Greek word here for powerful is the Greek word from which we get our English word energy. And it means that the Bible is active, powerful, effective, energized. What does the Bible do? Let's go back to uh, 2 Timothy. And how from infancy, infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scriptures God breathed. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, here we find first that the Bible is God's instrument that brings us salvation. Where else could you learn really about Jesus? Once Jesus was speaking to some very learned scholars in his day, um, they knew the Old Testament in and out. They were scholars. But he said to them, John 5, 39, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. When you're in my Bible reading, I had heard that every page in the Old Testament has something about Jesus. Well, I'm skeptical, so I tried to check it out for a year in my Bible reading. And sure enough, almost every page had something a prophecy, a picture, an image, a reference to the coming Messiah, God's Redeemer. God uses the Bible to bring us to believe and be saved. Incidentally, something you need to know as you try to share your faith, use the Bible. Memorize some verses, or know where at least know where they can be found. The Bible is what introduces us to Jesus. Then it is the Bible uh, God uses also to help us to live the Christian life. Now note the description in verse 16. The Bible is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Uh, teaching, King James translates that word doctrine. The Bible tells us what to believe about God, about the earth and the universe, about time, about angels, about people about each of us specifically, about government, about history and world events, about health and sickness, about life and death, about eternity. Uh, the Bible teaches us truths about all these things. The Bible teaches us what we can believe with absolute certainty. The next descriptive word here is rebuking. You know, I found that very seldom do I ever read the Bible without feeling a pang of guilt about something. Because the Bible uses it to make me feel guilty. Uh, he rebukes me. God uh, rebukes us through the Bible. Or uh, he might use a uh, story about somebody. Or he might use a command, either positive or negative, do something or don't do something. It may make us have a pang of guilt about something we're doing or not doing. God wants us to stop or start. And he wants, and he wants us to talk to him about it. We're promised in the Bible if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. So the Bible rebukes us. But it doesn't stop there. Notice the next word, correcting. When we're going in the wrong direction in anything, it turns us around to go in the right direction. But not only does God use the Bible to turn us around, notice the next words, training in righteousness. Uh, when we're headed in the wrong direction with some sin in our lives, the Bible rebukes us. It tells us positively what we should be doing. It turns us around. But God doesn't want us to just stand there idly, forgiving and knowing the right thing to do. It helps us to move on doing the right thing. And so uh, what this verse tells us, if we're heading this way and it's wrong, the Bible rebukes us. And it tells us that we need to turn around. And so we turn around. But then we don't just stand there. It tells us how to walk in that direction. And so that's what all that verse means. And uh, then training in righteousness. Uh, and verse 17 tells us that the Bible helps us to serve God properly. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
Equip there is a word which means complete, capable, proficient. You know, God wants you to be successful in serving Him. Uh, he wants you to be successful in whatever it takes in your individual life and unique circumstances to serve Him well. To live a good life. To know what to do in all your challenges. To get you successful through hard times. To help you know how to help people in their trials. And to help people come to faith in Christ. God wants you to be strong. Have peace and joy no matter what life brings. And God wants you to die well, however or whenever that happens, whether by sickness, accident, or persecution. For all that, his primary tool to help us is the Bible. Let's go on to our second point found in this verse. What the Bible does. Again, uh, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So it penetrates. The Bible penetrates. Uh, the King James says pierces. For the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Uh, we have in this verse some unusual language. The writer is using big terms to emphasize the thoroughness of the power that there is in the Bible to cut into and through our superficial or pretended faith. So the writer's using some poetic language. Remember the first audience of this book? The writer of Hebrews was writing to Jews who had espoused Christianity but who were now having second thoughts about that decision. They were suffering persecution from the government and separation, many of them, from their families. It was tough. And some of them were thinking, well, maybe I should just go back to becoming a Jew again instead of a Christian and deny Christ. And the writer is saying, pay attention to the scriptures. The Bible has the power to cut into any fakery in your life. It can penetrate deep into the recesses of your whole being. If your faith is real, it will endure. But if your faith is not real, the Bible has the power to cut into any part of your spiritual life. Are you real or not? The Bible has the power to expose whether you are real or not. If your faith is real, you'll pay attention to and live by the Bible. Notice these verses from the longest psalm in the Bible. Uh, that's Psalm 119. It has 176 verses with every one but two mentioning the Bible. Psalm 119, 9 through 11. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Now the second phrase here is uh, it, the Bible judges or discerns for the word of God judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. The Greek word here is to sift through and analyze evidence. It says it plainly instead of poetically like the first phrase, earlier phrase. Again, the reader is confronted with the idea. If his or her faith is real, it will endure. Not just based on how hard life is, or, but based on the written word. Because the written word is truth. Real truth is not a convenient whim. It is a solid, sometimes inconvenient foundation. Either Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, or He isn't. The Old Testament clearly teaches that. The New Testament makes it all even plainer. The writer of Hebrews is saying to his readers, you can trust the Bible. Or if you waver, the Bible will expose the fakery of your life and faith. Last, let me ask this question. Why is the Bible so alive and powerful? Why is it? Hebrews 4.13 Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. 
The Bible is from God. Notice carefully how God is described here. He sees everything. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him. One big word we have for describing God is the word omniscient. You don't use it over the breakfast table this morning. But it's a very important word, omniscient. It means that God knows everything. He not only knows the stars and the galaxies, He knows the continents and the oceans. He knows the maps of the nations. He not only knows that, but He knows all the addresses on your street. He knows everything you've ever done. He knows every thought you have ever ever thunk. And he knows every particle of your DNA. He designed it. And Jeremiah said that God even knit him together in his mother's womb. And Jeremiah said that not, only, not knowing anything about DNA. God knows everything. And he is the author of the Bible. It is God breathed. Or as Peter said, holy men of old spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God used human writers to record His Word, His message, to us. And the last part of this text is awesome and scary. That God knows everything and holds us accountable. He holds us accountable. To whom we must give account, the text says. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. You in our courts in America or across the world, we might be able to fool a judge. You may get out of a crime because you had a smart lawyer and get out of uh, and uh, get off because of some legal trick. But you can't fool God. Not one tiny bit. I love the statement in the Bible about heaven that God will wipe away all tears from our eyes. That means there are going to be tears in heaven. If He's going to wipe them away, there have to be some. Why? Are they tears of sorrow over what we've done? Well, probably. But I heard this thought too a long time ago and I wonder, will God in the judgment reveal to us what we might have done? What we might have been? What the impact of our lives might have been if we had been more obedient to Him? If we'd really walked with Him instead of going our own way so much? Will we weep over what God might have done in and through our lives which didn't happen because we weren't willing? I don't know. But you don't hear something really amazing? The amazing thing is that God knows everything about me and you. And loves me anyway. And loves you anyway. There's a recent song by Dottie Rambo. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. For it was grace that brought me liberty. I do not know just why He ever came to love me so. He looked beyond my faults and saw my need. I shall forever lift mine eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous the grace that caught my falling soul. He looked beyond my faults and saw my need. The point of our text today is to say that you can trust your Bible. You can trust your Bible to powerfully do its job. But God gives us the choice. Do we let the Bible do its powerful work in our lives? We have to be willing to do that. Let me read our text once more from one of the modern translations. This one, The New Living. For the Word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, 
cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, is it, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes. And He is the one to whom we are accountable. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. And thank You for its power. Thank You for its life. Thank You for the ability You have given this book to guide us Teach us what to believe, to help us in our lives, to be holy, to walk with you, but also to serve you well. And I pray, gracious Father, that you'd help every one of us today, not just to value this book, but to live according to its truths, according to its prohibitions, according to its commands, and profit from its stories from its genealogies, from all that's there, because you've given it to us that we might walk with you, that we might know you and serve you. And I pray, gracious, gracious God, that today, as we go forth from this place, you would help us to go forth with a greater appreciation of this great gift, this miracle book, this book that knows me, and to value it and to use it better. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're going to be dismissed in a moment, but let me remind you what uh, Randy reminded us all at the beginning. Uh, please go out without and keep your distance. And uh, if you're going to visit with somebody, please uh, maintain that distance out in the parking lot uh, so that we're not uh, gathered in small bunches in here. And uh, please, let's not shake hands or hug Holy wave, okay? You're dismissed. Thank you for listening to this message from Grace Point, an evangelical free church in Tucson, Arizona. Feel free to make copies of this message to give away to others, but please don't alter the content in any way without permission. We invite you to visit our website at www.gracepointtucson.org.